the scene. Sorry. Um, basically, almost anywhere you walk in Philadelphia, you're likely at the scene of a crime. It may be from the 18th or 19th or 20th century, but Philadelphia is known for the first zoo, the first library, the first hospital, the first stock exchange, the first medical school. But those aren't the only firsts though. Um, the country's first bank robbery happened here in the basement, oh wait a minute, let me get rid of that. In the basement of Carpenter's Hall in 1798, the hall was almost $163,000. Today, that would be 3.4 million. And Philadelphia was also the scene of America's first kidnapping uh, for ransom. Little Charlie Ross was nabbed from this front yard in Germantown in 1874, and he vanished forever. Um, and one of the country's first mass murders happened in Philadelphia. The headliners, the headline writers called the murders it the murders that shocked the world. The papers gave it bigger play than the vote on Colorado statehood. Um, it happened on a farm in South Philadelphia. Some of you might be familiar with the section called The Neck. Uh, the nonprofit Phil Abundance operates there now. It's within, it's within walking distance of Citizens Bank Park. Uh, Philadelphia was also the first city to lock up Al Capone. They put his 11 and a half carat diamond ring in the prison safe. And it's the only city where bank robber Willie Sutton broke out of two maximum security prisons. It was also, whoops, sorry. Mm. It was also home to the nation's largest murder ring in the 1930s. Their preferred weapon was arsenic sprinkled on the unsuspecting victim's spaghetti. Hang on a second. Hi. Uh, but they weren't adverse to bludgeoning, the evil eye, hits and runs, drownings. They even tried to buy live typhoid germs. There were so many victims that city police used this football stadium sized scoreboard to keep track of them all. You can see defendants, co-defendants. Um, and serial killer H.H. H. Holmes was famous for this murder castle in Chicago, but he was actually hanged on Passyunk Avenue in Philadelphia. This is the old Moya Mincing prison. If, if you're old enough, you may remember it. Um, that's where the hanging occurred. Moya Mensing was designed by architect uh, Thomas Eustick Walter. He is the same one who designed the beautiful US Capitol dome. He designed the dome to inspire and he designed Moya Mensing to in, in, intimidate um, with its battlements and its thick black bars. As I researched three centuries of Philadelphia crime, a pattern emerged to me. I could clearly see that Philadelphians have always been problem solvers who quietly take charge whenever things could break badly for their side. Um, Catholics and Protestants, let me just, um, aimed cannon at each other in the city streets in the Bible riots of the 1840s. After two Catholic churches uh, were burned to the ground, armed parishioners took up posts inside the remaining churches at night. Um, and when Mrs. Mary Hill, she was a very wealthy former madam, she was thrown from the window of her Pine Street mansion in 1868. It was her neighbors who headed straight up to her bedroom to look for clues. They quickly deduced she was killed with a fireplace poker in the sitting room. And one of them asked Mrs. Hill's daughter here and her son-in-law, uh, who else was in the house that night? When they said no one was, 
uh, the neighbor said, one of you two have committed the murder then. And the neighbors forced a patrol officer to arrest them on the spot. Um, when Octavius Cato, civil rights activist, was assassinated on South Street on election day, 1871. A patrolman let the killer slip away. It was a 61 year old brick maker who hopped off a trolley and chased down the 21 year old shooter. Um, and when Char four year old Charlie Ross here was kidnapped from his front lawn in Germantown on July 4th weekend in 1874, police laughed at his frantic father when he reported the crime. They told him some drunk probably had him and they'd drop him off when he, they sobered up. But before Charlie's kidnapper stepped over this low stone wall here and snatched him, no American child had ever been kidnapped. So no parent ever feared it would happen. And no police officer had ever been assigned to a kidnapping case. So before that day in 1874, the phrase, don't, don't take candy from a stranger, wasn't even a thing. So Charlie's family started searching on its own until the ransom notes arrived. Then the city officials tried to make up for lost time. They even hired the famous Pinkerton Detective Agency. They, they couldn't find Charlie, but they did send out 70,000 reward flyers about him, resulting in a half million people in the US and Britain and in Australia taking part in the search for Charlie. The kidnapping is the biggest criminal case in Philadelphia history to this day. It was in the headlines for 50 years. Here's the sheet music to popular songs written about Charlie. He was even written into a Broadway play. Here are Charlie Ross hair oil bottles, but no Charlie. Charlie vanished forever on July 1st, 1874. His father, Christian Ross, searched for him for 23 years until his death. Then his mother searched for him until her death. The kidnapping inspired uh, Richard Loeb and Nathan Leopold Jr. to nab Bobby Franks in the murder case that rocked Chicago in 1924. Charlie's case stayed in the headlines uh, until it was supplanted by the kidnapping of another little blonde Charlie in 1932, Charles Lindbergh Jr. Um, here's a man who was so hated that people came from Philadelphia, from Toronto, Boston, Cincinnati, and Fort, Fort, Fort Worth at their own expense to testify against him. H.H. H. Holmes earned a medical degree and he ran successful businesses, but his greatest talent was probably his ability to tell lies. He sold horses he didn't own. He was married to three women at the same time. He said he killed 27 people, but several of those victims later denied that. Um, Holmes was, his hanging was one of the most bizarre hangings in Pennsylvania history, but it's probably best to save that for the book. Um, Holmes was involved in some dodgy ventures with this man, uh, his business partner, ben, Benjamin Pitizel. They were running a sketchy patent business on Callow Hill Street in 1894, and they tried to pull off an insurance scam with Pitizel as the faux victim. They planned to get a med school cadaver and pass it off as Pitizel, but unbeknownst to Pitizel, Holmes really planned to kill him. Uh, his decomposing body was found upstairs in their Callow Hill Street office here. Because they owned some property together, Holmes decided to kill all seven remaining Pitizel family members and keep the entire pot for himself. He was only able to kill three of Pitizel's children before he was caught. 
People across the country were enraged. The children were in the news so often that headline writers only used their first names, Alice, Nellie, and Howard. Pinkerton detectives arrested homes in Boston, but it was a single relentless Philadelphia detective who built the case against him. Detective Frank Geyer spent months crisscrossing the country, gathering evidence against Holmes. He also found body parts from Alice, Nellie, and Howard. Geyer, the father of a 12-year-old girl himself, was horror struck by what Holmes did to the Pitizel children. Um, Geyer was present for Holmes' strange hanging at Moya Mincing. Moya Mincing, built when Andrew Jackson was the president, was finally demolished in 1868. The site is now an Acme market on Passion. Um, Holmes, who was deathly afraid of grave robbers, was buried under 20, uh, 2,000 pounds of cement in Holy Cross Cemetery, not far from Philadelphia Airport, just over the Delco line. Um, but the only bank and trust robbery of 1926, I don't know how many of you have seen the movie, It's a Mad, 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 Mad World, but it's like a scene out of that. And it would have been the most lucrative bank robbery in city history too, if it had worked. The four young bandits came armed with high caliber weapons, fast cars. They had $80,000 in their hands, almost $1.2 in today's dollars. But then the people of Philadelphia stepped up. Instead of running from a hail of bullets, men and women ran out into the street to offer any help they could to the one uninjured police officer left on the scene. Passerbys armed themselves with borrowed handguns and knives and rifles. People who had cars invited armed strangers to jump in. One man standing on a sidewalk yelled, does anybody have a gun? A woman in a second story apartment tossed a pistol and an ammo clip down to him. Two men laying a gas pipe decided they should join the chase instead. Um, George Stark, a mechanic, David Rittenhouse, a night watchman, and Walter Miller, a poultry salesman, all strangers till that morning tailed the armed robbers together in Stark's touring car. Stark had been trying to sell the car earlier that morning, but he decided to drive it into the gun battle instead. I was hoping with such a valiant gesture that his car made it through unscathed, but it didn't. The windshield was shot to pieces and the body was riddled with bullets. One woman confronted two armed robbers in her alleyway with her broom. She was less successful. Um, a police officer caught one of the armed bandits, George Stark, the me mechanic who drove into the fray, caught the ringleader. He spotted him on the street, and before the bandit could reach for his gun, Stark jammed a borrowed pistol into the back of his head and shouted, drop that gun or I'll, I'll blow your head off. Uh, other brave bystanders caught the other two bandits. This is Joe Curry, the leader of the bandits. He and the others were convicted of robbery and the shooting death of an off-duty policeman who had heard the shots and joined the chase. Legendary defense attorney, Chippy Patterson, who rarely lost a case, defended Curry. Although Patterson's family was straight out of the social register and Curry's was anything but, reporters overheard the two constantly joking and making puns during the trial. All four bandits were sentenced to death. Patterson's close friends said his health began to decline after he failed to get Curry off. Um, the largest murder ring in 
Philadelphia history and actually in the country at that time operated in South Philadelphia during the depression. And their weapon of choice was the arsenic sprinkled on the spaghetti. But there were so many murders, city police used, you know, a professional scoreboard to keep track of them. Um, the wing's goal was to collect life insurance payouts. There were hundreds of victims from New York to California. 70 bodies were exhumed in Philadelphia. The leaders, partners in crime were unhappy housewives who wanted to reform their husbands or kill them. Uh, when the detectives informed one filling station attendant that his wife had be, been arrested for slowly poisoning her first husband, the rattled man said he didn't know whether to call a doctor or a lawyer first. Um, you may have been to dinner in East Passion, now a lovely restaurant dotted neighborhood. Police called it Arsenic Alley in the 30s because so many killers lived there. Um, the ring members rarely said they were going to kill anyone. Their code for that was, we're going to send them to California. The ring grew so large that it had its own doctors, its own druggists, its own undertakers and insurance men. It even had a matchmaking service for new arsenic widows. Dozens of people were involved. But the leaders were Herman Petrillo here. He was a barber, a counterfeiter, an olive oil salesman, and a killer. Morris Bulber, a voodooist who claimed he could stop a trolley car in the middle of the street with his voodoo powers. Karina witch woman Favado, who sold wives charms to turn her husbands into faithful and successful men. She threw a party the day her 19 year old stepson died and she bought herself a new car right after her husband's funeral. And Paul Petrillo, the gang leader, he believed he could communicate with the devil himself. One woman called her, called him her demon lover and she emphasized he, she meant both literally. This is Rose Karina, a thrice widowed suspect. She married five times, but only two of her spouses survived, the two who refused to buy life insurance. Uh, the newspapers dubbed her the kiss of death. Again, the ring was broken because of a few honest people. The first was George Meyer, who was trying to go straight after serving a prison sentence in Delaware but he needed a $25 loan to start a rug cleaning business. One of the arsenic ringleaders offered him $600 in cash or more in counterfeit money, but there was a grim hitch. He would have to kill a young father with a lead pipe. Trying to stay on the right side of the law, Meyer went straight to Philadelphia police. They told him he had an overactive imagination. His next stop was the Treasury Department. They jumped on the counterfeiting angle. Um, at about the same time, city homicide detective Sam Riccardi here was putting together things he had heard about Karina Witch Woman Favato. He asked the DA to exhume her stepson's body. He was laughed out of the office. But he kept gathering information and kept trying. Riccardi spoke Italian well enough to serve as an interpreter in a pinch. And that was a big advantage for him in, in, in uh, investigating the case. Finally, the DA said Riccardi could sign the exhumation papers himself if he wanted, but he'd probably be sued by the Favados and laughed off the police force. The body was exhumed and it was loaded with arsenic. Assistant DA Vincent McDevitt uh, had the case. He knew it wouldn't be easy to prove a murder for profit ring based on the evil eye could thrive in the age of skyscrapers and instant coffee. But he examined hundreds of suspicious deaths from the 
from Philadelphia, the West Coast. Because of his exhaustive work, 70 bodies were exhumed. He, he, he investigated, uh, it, uh, he brought so many samples to the lab that the lab was overwhelmed and the new Federal Bureau of Investigation lab had to offer to help out. Now, not all the heroes were male. This tiny police stenographer sprang into action when a much taller, taller, larger um, female suspect uh, tried to commit suicide rather than testify. Janet McDaniel, this young widow with two children, jumped on the woman's back and dislodged the gun just in the nick of time. She later became one of Philadelphia's first female police detectives. The arsenic murder ring made headlines around the world. The, a female suspect chewed glass. A, a male suspect took a swing at the jury for a woman. A fortune teller rose from her seat in court and began scratching like a cat. At its end, 21 people were convicted. 15 got life sentences, two were executed. Now, in researching this book, I found three types of criminals. There were the torture killers motivated by their own strange fantasies. I avoided them. Uh, then there were criminals motivated by their, their circumstances. They might need money, for instance. And then there were the most interesting ones, like Willie Sutton. Sutton was a witty bilingual bank robber who read Adam Smith and Arthur Schopenhauer for fun. He, he once robbed a bank when he had $30,000 in his suit pocket. Uh, I would describe him as a eudaimonic uh, crook. He said he robbed just for the sheer thrill of it. He said he was happiest when he was pulling bank jobs. Uh, James Dickey called it living on the edge. Hunter Thompson called it edge work. Sutton entered one bank through a skylight. He pulled off a jewel heist inside a, a store crowded with shoppers. Uh, during the depression, after many Americans lost their life savings in bank collapses, moviegoers would actually stand and applaud when the newsreels featured Sutton hitting a big bank. A witness to one of his robberies said it was like being at the movies, only the usher had a gun. Sutton escaped from two maximum security prisons in Philadelphia. He and 11 other prisoners tunneled out of Eastern State between D-Day and V-E Day. Um, they popped up out of a hole near Fairmont Avenue in broad daylight. Here's a very muddy Sutton after he was nabbed. He was free for only 180 seconds because a brave passerby flagged down the police. Later, Sutton said, all I could think was, I'm going to change the language here. Oh, expletive, 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 expletive. Um, two years later, Sutton climbed a ladder in a blinding blizzard to escape Holmesburg prison. And while he was on the lam in Brooklyn, he had a nose job to change his appearance. After the surgery, he and a pal went to New York City Post Office to compare his new nose to the one on the wanted poster. Whoops. Um, but sometimes Philadelphians valiant efforts failed. Pace Alexander, one of the city's top attorneys and the first African-American judge, tried his best to save the life of Corinne Sykes in 1946, Sykes used a stolen social security card to get a job as a live-in housemaid in East Oak Lane in 1945. A couple days in, she killed the lady of the house with a massy butcher knife so she could steal her jewels. Now, Alexander never asked the jury to acquit Sykes. He just asked for mercy. He explained that his, his client had a mental age of eight and her boyfriend was pulling all the strings. It was 1946, so Sykes was convicted and she was sentenced to death. 
Alexander worked to the last minute, but Sykes never got a pardon. Ten of the villains in true crime Philadelphia took their last glimpses of the world from either atop a gallows or strapped into this electric chair at Rockview Prison. It's the only one that was ever used during the time that um, there were electrocutions in prison in um, Pennsylvania. But how they faced that fate is all over the map. Uh, Corinne Sykes asked a prison matron to take down a letter to her mother. In it, she promised to be brave, and she was. Paul Petrillo, the leader of the arsenic murder ring, spent his last night writing a letter to his oldest son, who, unbeknownst to him, had already changed his name to his last name to Petrill. Uh, George Twitchell Jr., convicted of bludgeoning his wealthy um, mother-in-law in 1868, found, was found dead in his cell the morning he was scheduled to hang. He had drunk a half bottle of a fast-acting poison that caused no pain. Oops. Uh, Anton Pope, Pope's Pennsylvania's first mass murderer, said the act of contrition in German and then tried to bend over, he's very tall, to help the guard who was placing his noose. Uh, Herman Petrillo often crabbed that his arsenic murder ring victims were taking too long to die, but he tried to stall his own execution every which way. He even wrote to Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, two guards had to hold Petrillo upright for the 30-step walk from his cell to the death chamber. He refused to sit in the electric chair. Guards pushed him down, but he jumped up repeatedly and demanded to talk to the governor. The four only bank robbers made totally different uses of their last hours on earth. When Death Row guards asked jokester Joe Curry if he had any last wishes. He said he wanted a pair of roller skates. Curry did uncharacteristically complain once of a pain in his side, but one of the other condemned men told him, you'll forget all about it in the morning. Hours after the execution, an autopsy showed Curry was actually suffering from acute appendicitis the night before he died. He had spent his last day discussing his finances with Chippy Patterson, making certain his wife Aggie and his mom would have enough money to live comfortably for the rest of their lives. And he spent his last night writing letters to the two of them. He didn't need to worry about Aggie. A few months later, police were searching for her and her new sweetheart, seen leaving the scene of a shooting in the car Curry willed to her. Uh, Curry's funeral drew so many spectators that 50 uniformed police were assigned to crowd control. Now, one of the other bandits, Frankie Doris, was on the edge of collapse his last night, cursing his friends. So why didn't they help me out of this jam? He kept asking anyone who would listen. William Giuliano, another, was fatalistic. He drew a crude heart on his cell wall and filled it in with his name and his execution date. On his last day, Harry Bentley asked a lawyer to draw up a statement that would exonerate at least one man serving a prison term unjustly. He spent his last evening writing letters to his family, and he wrote on his wall, too. He said, this is no man's land. Um, one of H.H. H. Holmes' last acts was receiving his first communion and his last communion. Uh, Holmes converted to Catholicism, but not until after it became apparent his appeals would be denied. Um, while the nuns in a church about a block away were already praying for his soul, Holmes downed a hearty breakfast of eggs, toast, and coffee before he headed to the gallows. Now, 
I think one of the best things about researching is the surprises that are just fun to dwell on. Things you trip over on your way to other things. Researching Charlie Ross, I also found that July 4th weekend, 1874 was a historic in, in many other ways. It was the cornerstone for Philadelphia City Hall was laid that weekend. City Hall was, was designed to be the world's tallest building, something I never knew. Uh, unfortunately, it took 30 years to construct. So in the meantime, the Eiffel Tower and the Washington Monument surpassed it. Um, the Philadelphia Zoo, the nation's first zoo, opened its doors for the first time that weekend. There were 183 animals. The crowd favorite was the sloth, so at rest that some viewers insisted it, it was dead. Um, the book's first chapter is about the most lucrative house burglary in Pennsylvania history. Um, three state witnesses were unable to testify because one of them was shot and stabbed while waiting for a bus. One of them was fished out of the Atlantic with a heavy chain padlocked around his body and a bullet hole in his head. And the third was blown up here on Alma Street. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever been on Alma Street, but it's a very, very narrow one way street. And uh, the person who blew up uh, this witness's car was a professional because they stacked the dynamite in such a way that it made everything blow up over the roofs for the most part and didn't hurt even a three year old girl who had just waved goodbye to the driver. Um, I found many residents of Alma Street were sitting in their front rooms when the explosion occurred. Uh, that seemed strange because it was just before three in the afternoon. It turned out they were all waiting for American Bandstand, a local show to come on their TVs. Um, one of my favorite characters was Myrtle Vaughs, a World War II era um, home burglar. She, she, had a, she was a housemaid, but she had this lucrative sideline. Police called her 30-minute Gertie for her ability to strip a new employer's home of valuables in less than a half hour. Um, and Charles Becker, who operated a small zoo in his Northern Liberties backyard in the 1860s, he made the fatal mistake of jabbing his five foot rattlesnake with a pen knife to get it to rattle for some visitors. The snake bit his finger and Becker spent the last half hour of his life writing his will. This is Lillian Reese, the burglary defendant who was so attractive that newsmen reported what she wore to her trial each day. My favorite was a tight white sweater, a tight white skirt with a tighter white sweater. Um, Philadelphians really are a resourceful bunch, whether they're committing crimes or stopping them. Sometimes history ignores what average people do. You know, history is des de described as a mosaic, but sometimes there's piece, pe pe pieces are missing and nobody realizes it. Ordinary people who do extraordinary things should go down in history. I learned that many average Philadelphians were agents of change over the 340 years of city history. Heroes like Detective Sam Riccardi, who toppled the largest murder ring in the country by following his hunches, even when his superiors laughed him out of their offices. And mechanic George Stark, uh, night watchman David Rittenhouse and chicken salesman Walter Miller, who made a split second decision to drive into a gun battle to help a patrolman who was totally outnumbered. They're heroes who exemplify our cherished values. This is true crime, but it's true crime with endnotes. I was careful to document 
all the details so that their deeds of these unsung heroes can be remembered and recognized. I, I think, you know, I'm a reporter and I believe that stories are how we all learn. We love them, you know, from Greek myths on. Writing coach coaches can always point out that no kid ever said, daddy, read me some facts. Everyone wants a story. And I hope you've enjoyed these stories from True Crime Philadelphia. Um, if anybody has any questions, please let me know.